This module focuses on writing good survey questions. It presents several different rules for question writing that will help guide you into writing better survey questions. Good survey questions usually measure behaviors, attitudes, perceptions, beliefs, facts, and or demographic characteristics. Keep in mind, when you ask people a question, it should be one that they can reasonably be expected to answer. That is actually the first rule of question writing. The respondent must be able to answer the question. Secondarily, that answer should be meaningful. You can ask people, for example, how many cells are there in your left forefinger, and they may give you an answer, but that answer probably isn't accurate or meaningful. I could follow up with how attached are you to those cells, literally, figuratively. What does that mean? You have to ask people something that they can make sense of. Keep in mind that things that may be very important to you at one point in your life may not be all that important at another. For example, right now, if I were to ask you your GPA, you probably would have a pretty good idea of what it was, of what it is. But if you were to ask me what was my GPA when I graduated as an undergraduate from college, I have a rough idea, but I wouldn't be very accurate at this point. The next rule is no double-barreled questions. You want to ask one thing at a time. For example, were I to ask, please indicate your level of agreement with the following statement, Cal Poly Pomona provides a high quality education and offers a wide variety of classes. This is difficult for you to agree or disagree with because what if you believe we offer a high quality of education but that we don't offer a wide variety of classes? It's impossible for you to answer the question because it's actually two questions. It should be asked as, Cal Poly provides a high quality of education first, and second, Cal Poly offers a wide variety of classes. So again, that rule is no double-barreled questions. Ask one thing at a time. The question should also be comprehensible. Grammar and spelling matter. Make sure you are very careful in your presentation of your question. Do you believe that capital punishment are right or wrong? That sort of grammatical error will also reduce your response rates. Also note, my answer categories don't match. That'll come off as a grammatical or a spelling or a comprehension error in many cases. Make sure your answer categories match however you frame the question. Ambiguous questions should be avoided. You want to be as specific as possible when you ask a question. For example, were I to ask you, on a scale of 1 to 10, how socially integrated are you? That's an impossible question to answer. What is social integration? What exactly does that mean? Even something like how many alcoholic drinks have you had over the last week is too ambiguous. A drink is a specified amount, and it should, that should be included in the question. For example, 12 ounces of beer, 5 ounces of wine, 1 and a half ounces of hard alcohol, and 2 to 3 ounces of a liqueur are generally considered one drink, but you have to let the reader know that. In addition, terms may vary cross-culturally. When sexuality research first began being conducted in both the United States and South and Central America, researchers ran into the problem of that in North America, there was a lot more fluidity in the roles taken by, GL by gay men whereas in Latin America you tended to see more rigid, more rigid sexual orientation roles, but that the individual who was the top in the relationship was not seen as gay. So when they went to Latin America looking for gay men to perform the same studies on or to have them fill out the same surveys that had been filled out in North America, they weren't getting the same sample of individuals. Keep that in mind. The level of wording should be comprehensible to your respondents. A good rule of thumb is to use an 8th grade reading level for adults. If you have a sample that has a large number of non-native speakers and you aren't going to be translating it into their native language, 
I would drop that level down a little bit lower too. You want to make sure that everyone taking your survey understands exactly what you're asking them. For example, if I were to ask you, do you believe in lycanthrope, you might not be able to answer the question. If I were to ask you if you believe in werewolf, you probably could. Bias should be minimized. Words have positive and negative connotations, and your choice of wording can affect how individuals respond. For example, if you ask people if they support welfare, the majority say no, but if you ask them if they, if they support assistance for the poor, the majority say yes. Those are actually the same thing. It's that welfare has some bias in it. This is one of the types of leading questions you can run into. If there's bias in wording, the question becomes what is called leading. It pushes people towards a particular answer. In addition, you want to avoid what's called prestige bias. Prestige bias is when you associate something with a famous person. Sometimes people want to make questions accessible by referencing something that's happened to somebody famous or that's been in the news. Unfortunately, then you've got people responding to that individual rather than the, the actual survey question. It is always better to ask factual rather than abstract questions. It's easier for people to answer questions that ask about a particular time frame than to answer questions about their lives in general. It's also better to ask several smaller questions and construct an, in, an index than to ask one big question, such as, how is your self-esteem? It's better to ask a series of questions that together make up the components of self-esteem. So if you're going to ask people over your average week, instead ask over the last seven days. I've already mentioned how bias and wording results in leading questions, questions in which it seems as if one answer is more desirable than another. As a general rule, you want to avoid leading questions. You want to avoid having any kind of stake for the participant to answer in any kind of way, whether this is an actual financial or potential, I want to get into the next part of the study, or if it's simply that they're going to feel better about themselves, or you've tipped them off that something may or may not be normative. Make sure that none of the answers choices seem as if they're better than others. For example, if I was to ask people, many people get ahead by working hard. Others prefer to lie, cheat, and steal. Thus, we're measuring how hard people work. Over the last week, how many hours did you work? 0 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, or 41 plus? Worded this way, I would be inflating how much people report that, that they work. If there's a culturally normative right answer, people are going to sort of lean towards that answer. <clears throat> For example, we all know about how much we should be working out. As a result, when you ask people how much they work out, it tends towards the Surgeon General's recommendation. Instead, you should ask people over the last seven days, how much did you exercise? And of course, you'd need to define exercise clearly. Sensitive or threatening questions are those for which individuals may fear social sanctions or simply disapproval if they deviate from a norm. The key to asking good sensitive or threatening questions on a survey is to ask them in a way that it implies there is no normative answer. There is no normal. And actually, there really isn't. One way to do this is to always place any answer choices that you think uncomfortable individuals will choose last. This way they have to read all the other answer choices first before they get to those answers. So for example, if you were conducting a survey on sexual behavior and you asked individuals how frequently they masturbate, you would want never to be the last answer and you'd want to start with the most frequent answer. You also want to be careful about having double negatives in questions that appear because you've asked people to agree or disagree with the statement that is a negative statement. That sounds a little confusing. For example, 
If I were to ask you to strongly agree to strongly disagree to the statement, police officers should not be required to take psychological evaluations. If you strongly agree, great. You strongly agree that police officers should not be required to take psychological evaluations. But if you strongly disagree, you strongly disagree that police officers should not be required to take psychological evaluations. That just sounds a little bit confusing. It would make a lot more sense if the person simply agreed or disagreed that police officers should be required to take psychological evaluations. Sometimes you can't avoid the situation. In certain cases for indices or scales, you're going to have to run your statements in both a positive and a negative direction. But if you're just writing individual survey questions, as much as possible, you want to avoid this sort of situation. Some people feel like disagreement is being rude. They feel that if they're telling you that they disagree with your statement, they're somehow invalidating you. While I don't believe that to be true, I can't discount the feelings of my respondents. You want to avoid making disagreement seem disagreeable so that people who don't like to rock the boat feel comfortable expressing their true answer category. You want to make it very clear that there is no normative position and that any answer is helpful to you, the researcher. This is very important. Similar to sensitive or threatening questions, people have to feel that any answer is equally valid. It's important to avoid having any false premises in your statement. For example, if you start out with something like everyone is concerned about, and the reader isn't concerned about that issue, you've actually just alienated them and made them less likely to answer your question. Or if you say to people, as children, we all, and the person didn't do that, again, they're not going to be filling out your survey. Unless you're doing it for a very explicit reason, you generally want to avoid asking about future intentions or what people would do in a situation. What people would do in a situation is what people like to believe about themselves. It's not what they would actually do. What people are intending to do is what they hope to do. It, again, may not be what they're actually going to do. So, for example, were I to ask people, what would you do if you saw a building on fire and a baby in the window? Go about your business. It's not your problem. Call 911. Rush in and save the baby. It's worth the risk. Get out the garden hose you always carry with you and start dousing the fire. Or stand around and watch. This could be interesting. Despite studies demonstrating that what's likely to happen is for people to stand around and watch, most people would actually probably tell us that they're going to call 911 or save the baby. What they tell us they'd want to do is what's the normative answer for our hope, not for what we actually do. As I mentioned, there are some special cases that might be an exception to this rule. For example, if you were, I did a survey at the auto show. And in that case, we were interested if whether or not people visiting the auto show actually plan to buy a new car. That's an exception that makes sense. Provide clear, unambiguous instructions. Be clear about any time frames referenced. Be clear about the number of responses. Is it check all that apply or select only one answer? Make sure you define any key terms. As I mentioned before, if you ask people how many alcoholic drinks they've had in the last week, you need to clearly define what constitutes an alcoholic drink. Are there any special directions? And are there any necessary skip instructions that you need to provide? Make sure your answer categories are clear, that they don't overlap at all, or if you're asking for a single answer, that it's absolutely clear to the person filling in that answer in what format it should be provided. It is absolutely imperative that your answer categories be mutually exclusive, assuming it's not a fill-in question. This means that each respondent must fit into one and only one answer category. So for example, if I were to ask people whether they fit into the following answer categories on this slide, you can see if an individual earned exactly $40,000, they would fit into two categories. They don't know which answer category they should select.
Answer categories must also be exhaustive. This means that everyone should fit into at least one answer category. In the example you see stated here, I've left out the category for married people. If I'm going to ask people for their marital status, I need to make sure that everybody's status fits in. It's always a good idea to look at how other people have measured things, especially if you're doing a more complicated index or scale. Don't reinvent the wheel. If someone else already has created a good way to measure something, use their measure and cite them as a source. You may have to make some necessary adjustments, but their version may actually already be tested and legitimated. How are you going to code non-responses? What if somebody doesn't answer a survey question? Are you going to drop them from the analysis? Are you going to extrapolate what their answer would have been given what other people have said? This is something you should decide ahead of time, and there are many things to consider. For some types of statistical analysis, missing data means that the individual has to be removed from the data set. In other cases, they only would be removed from some pieces of the analysis. At the same time, extrapolating and considering means that you're making a guess at what the person would have said. You may not be accurate. It's important to stay aware of current events. Events may temporarily sway attitudes and opinions. For example, we don't ask people about airline safety on September 12th, not with all the movies about September 11th being shown the day before. In many different ways, something that happens in the news could temporarily alter people's attitudes about something. Then you just want to wait a few weeks until the hubbub has died down. This actually happened to Dr. McGoldrick and I when we were doing focus groups on campus about crime. In the first set of focus groups, people, students showed no concern about crime whatsoever. Then, in the interim period, there were two widely publicized incidents on campus that actually turned out to not be crimes, but for a few days people thought perhaps a crime, very serious crimes had occurred. In one case, there was a report of a ninja with a sword, which actually turned out to be a goth student with an umbrella. In another case, tragically, um, what seemed to have been a stabbing actually turned out to be an incident of self-harm. Despite the fact that these two non-events happened, these two events were non-events, I should say, they were publicized widely across the campus as crimes initially. As a result, in the focus groups we conducted following these two events, students expressed extreme concern about crime. Then, after a few weeks, when the, the hubbub had died down, students went back to expressing no concern whatsoever. Are you going to have don't know or neutral categories in any of your scales? For example, if you're going to ask people to strongly disagree, disagree, agree, and strongly agree, are you going to have a neutral category in the middle? Or for opposer support, same, same issue? If you lack a neutral position, you force people that don't really care, are fence sitters or floaters, to choose a position they don't really hold. On the other hand, sometimes people may opt out into a neutral category when they actually have a weakly held opinion, and studies show that the presence of a neutral category does decrease the strength of responses. There isn't a right answer here. It's just something you have to carefully think through before you write your survey. The order in which you place questions can actually significantly alter responses. Putting a general question followed by very specific case questions and having specific case questions followed by a general question might change people's responses. We've seen this happen with both the GSS happiness questions and their abortion scale. Asking people about all the incidences in which one may or may not have choose to have an abortion or need to have an abortion reveals a different response on, on pro-choice questions than if you ask those questions after the general pro-choice, pro-life question. I just wanted to highlight this particular database here that's put out by the SSRIC. 
I recommend it as one potential source for survey questions. You can take a look at the different surveys here and see how they worded their questions. This may be of some assistance to you in the following week.